She was in a little bit of trouble, Maria Miller, for claiming £90,000 expenses on a second home, which she then sold for a million pounds profit. What's so bad about that? Don't understand. <laughs> she was claiming mortgage interest payments, but when the interest rate dropped, she kept claiming at the same rate. Her parents were living in it. And she still oh. claimed it was a second home, even though her parents were in it. All right, but I now have to say, the Common Standards Committee have ordered her to repay £5,800 and apologise to MPs. They also said her attitude breached MPs' code of conduct. <laughs> <laughs> that must be going some. <laughs> her, <laughs> her attitude. Well, her bizarre, attitude was not to answer the question. And when said, you know, can you turn up... Um, the financial details, she prevaricated, avoided the question and refused to answer directly. Yes. This is the Culture Secretary. Mr Holland? Uh, front page of the Times, uh, expenses are back. Matthew, <sighs> MPs' expenses, yes. Maria Miller has apologised, but there's... Oh, and didn't she just? Yes. I mean, it was really from the bottom of the heart. Well, 30 seconds. <laughs> 27, I think. It was, <laughs> it was a cursory apology um, to, to uh, not... Actually, it's interesting because the, the, the opprobrium heaped on her is... is is how she reacted to the investigation. Yes. The and most serious charges were dismissed, but the, 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 yes. it was how she responded to the, <laughs> the minor didn't... charges yeah. of taking interest payments that were too high. Well, just, it, does, be... it does make you wonder, you know, this is off the back of the, the, the massive Daily Telegraph sure, expose. Sure, sure. I mean, come on. Although, in 2000, I, I, if I'm correct, in 2007, she remortgaged her house and, and oh. took more money on that property, yeah. which would then be which qualifying is, for interest payments. Which is legal. Perfectly well, legal. It was, the, it was the fact that she didn't change do the you know what claims. Le le legal, but... Because yeah. this yeah. is important. This woman, she remortgaged the house to more than double yes. what she paid for it. So, so and the taxpayer is paying the interest on that loan that she's obviously spent on something else. So, if, that, so, it out to so if that's legal... It's, yes. It is but, legal but, 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 for MPs. But and, and not, not satisfactory to the, to the taxpayer. Right, well, did you see the bit where the, the investigating committee says she was supposed to pay back all the interest, which is about 20, 30,000, I think. 45,000. 45,000, yeah. Uh, and then you know, she managed to persuade them that, oh, and her lawyers did, yeah. that actually what she only needs to owe was 6,000. Sure. It? So, so uh, all above board, I'm sure. Oh, OK. I'm spitting feathers over that. Well, I bet you were. Well, I don't think you're the only one. She it... needs proper sacking. They need to take the profit away from her as well, from that house. Because we bought it for her. She made £1.27 yeah. £1 million pounds on that house and we paid the mortgage for the whole time. But, but I, I, I can't believe it. I can't actually believe we live in a country where everybody get away with that. I'm so furious. Do you think, do you, and let's have the last one, do you genuinely think she survived because she's a woman. Yeah, I that's absolutely do. That's a do. terrible indictment. I absolutely do, because that's what it's become. You know, David Cameron doesn't want Tokenism. to get another drub in from the opposition about not having any women in his cabinet, and there's only five. Yeah. She goes, you know, who else? I, I absolutely, totally believe that. Okay. Dave right, Cameron go. is a spineless idiot. Well, you may say that. <laughs> You he may is. say that. Should we move sacker. on, Dominic, before uh, we get uh, into the top? If he wants to get any votes at as, all, he'd sack her. As contentious. It was the political scandal that put some MPs in jail, but today the Cabinet Minister, Maria Miller, got the full, nay, fulsome support of the Prime Minister, despite the fact she was censured by the Standards Committee for hindering an inquiry into her expenses claims. For that, she was forced into a humiliating apology on the floor of the House, and she has to repay 5800 in overclaimed accommodation allowances. So, what happened to hardline David Cameron, the one who talked tough on cleaning up expenses? Our chief correspondent, Laura Kunzberg, joined me. What exactly did Maria Miller do? Well, Maria Miller is one of just four women in the cabinet, and that is politically significant. And she was accused of claiming £90,000 worth of taxpayers' money for a house where she lived with her parents. Now, what the Commission has decided in all their wisdom is that that arrangement in principle was OK, but she did overcharge a little bit, an administrative error, they called it, and as a result, she's having to pay back nearly £6,000. But humiliatingly, she became the first serving cabinet minister to have to say sorry from the benches of the House of Commons. But after an investigation of nearly a year and a half, it came down to this 32-second apology. With permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to make a personal statement in relation to today's report. The report resulted from an allegation made by the member for Bassett Law. The committee has dismissed his allegation. The committee has recommended that I apologise to the House for my attitude to the Commissioner's inquiries. And I, of course, 
unreservedly apologise. I fully accept the recommendations of the committee and thank them for bringing this matter to an end. Not Ooh. exactly contrite, and not just the fact that she gave such a short apology, but you might think she was in disgrace. But look at this. Behind her, not just your normal backbenchers, not just government whips, but the Cabinet Minister, Jeremy Hunt, who moved from the front bench to the back bench to give her visible support, and Sir George Young just tucked behind there, a very senior Conservative indeed. And that really tells us that the top of the Conservative Party is tonight fully behind her. But did she sort of get off virtually scot-free? Well, the independent commissioner, fascinatingly, the independent person overseen mm. by a committee of MPs, said she should have paid back £40,000. And what's also striking is the tone of her letters to the commissioner, where she really, really dragged her feet at every step of the way. And that is actually what landed mm -hmm. her in trouble. One MP said to me it was the bullying way that she tried to get out of it that actually led to her having to say sorry. It is extraordinary because at the height of the spend expenses scandal, you know, when people were, were found guilty, I have to say, lots of people went to jail. They did, and believe it or not, in a couple of weeks, it's five years since that all blew up in the first place. What's interesting is that many MPs I've spoken to today sort of say, oh, well, look, the rules have changed, we've all moved on, nobody thinks that Maria Miller was actually fiddling things on purpose, she just made mistakes. But I think the public might feel rather differently. And tonight, a couple of the front pages, here we have the Times, fury grows as expenses, Prime Minister clings to their job, and the Telegraph, MPs conspire to save Miller. And remember, one of the problems of this in the first place was the idea that MPs were judging themselves and that is part of what's happened in this case. So we'll be looking to the reshuffle. Perhaps. Laura, thank you very much indeed. The inquiry. Now, the Commons Committee on Standards, that's made up of MPs, watered down the strictures of the Independent Parliamentary Commission for Standards. It cleared her of making false expense claims and said she'd overclaimed on her mortgage payments though it did so by a lot less than the Commission had concluded. The papers this morning are far from happy, making the familiar claim that when it comes to expenses, MPs still don't get it. And the apology itself hasn't gone down that well either. We're apologising to the Commons yesterday. We're joined now by our political correspondent, Ian Watson. Ian, how strong is the feeling in uh, Westminster and the media that the punishment hasn't fitted the crime? It's pretty strong in the uh, media, Andrew. Uh, not quite as strong at Westminster. As you can imagine, Labour MPs are beasting in. John Mann, who made the original complaint against uh, Maria Miller, is criticising the Committee on Standards because in their uh, weighty tome, this 116-page report, <laughs> um, actually most of this is made up of correspondence between her and the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner, the person who carries out the initial inquiry. That, the Commissioner said that she should pay back £45,000. In the end, the committee, made up largely of MPs, there are three lay members, but largely of MPs, decided she should pay back only £5,800, the amount that she herself identified as an administrative error on her mortgage. So John Mann saying actually this system is effectively a cover-up by MPs. They're marking their own homework. Another Labour MP, Thomas Doherty, is saying the police should look into the matter. But when it comes to her own colleagues, and this is why I think she'll survive in some form at the top table, uh, but uh, her colleagues are saying, look, um, perhaps you should have handled this better. Perhaps this, the brevity of this apology was uh, inappropriate. Nonetheless, the key central allegation that in effect she was using taxpayers' money to fund a home for her parents, that was disproved. And because that was the case, there might not be a huge enthusiasm for her, but there's not huge denunciations either. And it was interesting that uh, asked a second time, asked yesterday, of course, in the wake of the report, but asked today in the wake of that very brief apology, the Prime Minister himself gave his backing to Maria Miller.
What happened yesterday is that uh, Maria Miller was actually cleared of the original charge made against her. Uh, it was found she had made mistakes. She accepted that, repaid the money. She apologised unreservedly to the House of Commons. So I think that we should leave it there. Well, Ian, the Prime Minister, Downing Street, are sticking by their culture secretary. What happens next? Well, certainly sticking by for the time being, although the rumours at Westminster <laughs> is that if there's a reshuffle post those difficult European elections, uh, that she might be heading... Uh, to Wales. <laughs> ...heading west rather than south, but heading to Cardiff and becoming uh, the next uh, uh, Secretary of State for Wales. But certainly... Um, David Cameron keen to keep women at the cabinet table, but perhaps not in that current role. And the reason they, she may not stay in that current role is, of course, she's normally in charge of the whole process of regulating the press as culture secretary. And some people are saying that the reaction in the press, far more hostile than at Westminster uh, this morning, talking of MPs covering this whole, uh, this whole matter up. That reaction uh, was perhaps driven by the fact that Maria Miller, of course, agreed with some other politicians, including her opposite number, Harriet Harman, in setting up this royal charter on press regulation. As you well know, not much has really happened since, and most of the press are going off to do their own thing. So I think it might be seen as sensible to move her from the firing line, but the press themselves have been very critical, not just of Maria Miller and what some of them are calling her, her arrogance, but are also suggesting that actually MPs' expenses could be back in the agenda again. None of that will be welcome for David Cameron. So her political career isn't over, but she may be up for a change sometime soon. All right, Ian, thank you for that. I'm sure you've cheered up the people of Wales this morning watching us. Uh, that's Ian Watson there. The former Telegraph editor, Tony Gallagher, was on the BBC Today programme this morning. He accused Maria Miller of, quote, breathtaking arrogance and repeated his claim that David Cameron's director of communications, he's called Craig Oliver, uh, he accused him of putting pressure on Mr Gallagher not to publish a story about Maria Miller's expenses. Now, Craig Oliver reacted angrily to that allegation. This is what he said. It is utterly false for Tony Gallagher to suggest he was threatened uh, over Levison by me in any way. My conversation with him was about the inappropriate doorstepping of an elderly man. Now, that was a reference to Maria Miller's parents, who were at the centre of the original Telegraph story because they were in the house that she was claiming expenses for. Right. Let's see if we can speak to Tony Gallagher now, see if we've made contact. Uh, Mr Gallagher, can you hear me now? I can hear you very well. Oh, good. Thank you for that. Apologise for the uh, technical glitch there. Uh, we quoted Craig Oliver's uh, uh, statement there, saying it's utterly false, He's his words, for you to suggest that he threatened you over Levison in any way. I mean, he's effectively accusing you of lying. Well, I'm very happy to discuss Craig Oliver all day, but it's... It, he hasn't really addressed the key issue and in rushing out a denial he's made the story about Craig Oliver rather than about the far more substantive point which is this is all about press freedom and the threats to press freedom. And bear in mind Craig Oliver was only the third call that the Telegraph got. The first call and the far more sinister call was made by Maria Miller's special advisor to my reporter Holly Watt essentially to warn her off the story. Uh, Joanna Hindley said, Maria has obviously been having quite a lot of meetings around Leveson. I'm just going to flag up that connection for you to think about. You might want to talk to people higher up your organisation. Miss Hindley then spoke to a very senior executive at uh, The Telegraph to point out exactly that. We then got a third call from Craig Oliver who pointed out she's looking at Leveson and the call is badly timed. I think if you're making a series of telephone calls to a newspaper organisation which is investigating the conduct of a cabinet minister, that comes quite close to menace. Bear in mind also at the time there was quite a climate of anti-press hysteria in the aftermath of Leveson. So when a cabinet minister's advisers ring up newspapers in that fashion and warn them in that fashion, they're bound to take those threats very seriously. Happily, we decided we were going to publish in, in any event. Indeed so the you fact did. that Craig Oliver wants to make the story about him uh, is neither here nor there. OK, uh, I'll come back to Mr Oliver in a minute. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, set of examples you've given there of pressure being put on the newspaper in the context of Leveson. Uh, what evidence can you offer to substantiate these claims? Well, we, Andrew, we reported most of this at the time, and I don't think it's disputed that Joanna Hindley uh, rang uh, the Daily Telegraph and was uh, recorded making those threats. Um, it, it, all that is, it, the fact that we're debating it now is really in the aftermath of, of so, the report. It was all debated very fully at the time. And, so if need be, you could furnish the evidence the to substantiate what you say, including recordings. 
Yes, I, yes, I think we could. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, I think we could. Okay. Uh, Craig Oliver says more that... More broadly, uh, of course. Lever let, let me continue. Craig Oliver says that he spoke to you because your journalists were harassing members of uh, Miss Miller's family. Is that true? Well, it's a bit late to be raising the spectre of, of harassment of the family um, 16 months after the event. And, and again, I would suggest it's a bit of a smokescreen. But I mean, he says he was doing it at the time. The way in which a cabinet minister wanted to muzzle, uh, muzzle the free press. I, I don't recall that at all. Um, more to the point, if we want to discuss that particular issue, it should be pointed out that the reporter in question had a very amicable conversation lasting just under 10 minutes with Maria Miller's uh, father on the doorstep. Uh, it turned out he was even a telegraph reader. So the, the man was not in any way distressed, he didn't seem in any way harassed, and she left after he clearly didn't want to talk about it in any great detail. So but, there was no question of harassment at the time. The fact but, that okay, um, but just to clarify, um, private, uh, private life is being uh, laid bare is not our fault. Right, but just to clarify, are you saying that Craig, Craig Oliver at the time did not raise concerns about telegraph behaviour towards the Miller family? The point of his phone call at the time, and my very clear recollection of this, was that it was in the context of Leveson. Bear in mind the climate of anti-press hysteria at the time. Every newspaper was super sensitive about the prospect of Leveson proposals being implemented and being caught up in a, in a scandal in the wake of the uh, report. And bear in mind also that most newspapers and most national newspaper editors can recount similar conversations with government spin doctors over the past 12 months. MPs, officials, as businessmen will all raise the spectre of Leveson to try and uh, chill newspapers from their proper investigative function. Now, special advisers uh, regularly have conversations with journalists and editors and vice versa. Uh, we speak to them. Uh, they're always uh, private conversations. Why did you decide to break the privacy and publish uh, the Hindley conversations? Well, we decided to do that because they were calling into question the veracity of what the reporters had said. And we wouldn't have otherwise made those conversations public. But they, uh, they lied about the nature of what it was that we were uh, attempting to prove. They were trying to throw up a smokescreen around uh, the important fact that Maria Miller had uh, wrongly claimed expenses. And they told lies about my reporters. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't prepared to have their integrity challenged, which was why we made the conversations of Joanna Hindley and Craig Oliver public. Um, well, once they came for the integrity of the staff, I'm afraid we decided that um, the convention by which we wouldn't publish those conversations had to be abandoned. It would also be fair to say, though, would it not that it played to your anti-Leveson agenda as well? Oh, I you could say that, and, and undoubtedly we've got a dog in the fight. I make no, no bones about that. I think Maria Miller in many ways has done us a tremendous favour because uh, her conduct, the conduct of her advisers, has shown, I think, very clearly why no politician should ever be allowed near uh, the press. Once they get their hands on the press, that ratchet will only turn one way. They can't resist keeping their hands off the press. You saw the way the House of Commons voted overwhelmingly in favour of a royal charter. MPs do not like a free press. They hate us for the fact that we exposed uh, their expenses uh, troubles back in 2009 and they're desperate to try and get one over us and ensure that in some way um, uh, their foot is on our throats. Uh, given your experience or your staff's experience with uh, Maria Miller's special advisor, uh, given what we've now seen the parliamentary commissioner has said about uh, the expenses, I put aside how the MPs voted, what the independent commissioner has said, do you believe that Maria Miller's fit still to be culture secretary? I don't really have a view one way or the other on whether Maria Miller should resign. I think that's a matter for, for David Cameron and, and the government. What I would say is that I think she got off extraordinarily lightly, um, which is perhaps inevitable given that you've got 13 MPs effectively marking their own homework and defending uh, one of their own. The language in the report is absolutely extraordinary. I suspect if similar language was used about a newspaper editor, that person would be out on their ear by uh, close of day. I'd point out one other thing. Thing. If this was a benefit claimant, I think that benefit claimant would have had the police involved very, very quickly. And I'm rather surprised, uh, rather than her resignation, that we, we don't yet have the spectre of a police inquiry into this matter. Because it seems to me that at the very least there is something worth investigating about her conduct. All right, Tony Gallagher, thanks for joining us. And I, again, I'm sorry about the sound problems we had at the beginning of the interview. That's uh, Tony Gallagher, the former editor of the Daily Telegraph. What do you make of what you've just heard? 
Well, I can understand if the Joanna Hindley phone call is as described. That that is clearly something. Does it sound credible to you? Well, they say they've got a recording of it. So, and if it is. If that's right, well, that's not a conversation should take place. I don't think it's quite true that there are numerous conversations where people are threatening Levis and I was a special advisor and I never did, and it would be silly to do so, quite frankly. Every well, phone hang on, then, let's isn't hear done from... the ministers instructions. But don't be wary of that. Then let Maria Miller say, my special advisor was acting without my knowledge and approval. We have not heard anything. Is she anything still the special advisor? As far as, as far as I I'm know. Not sure, I'm I not aware she left. left. I believe I think, she's, yes. Let's not forget, this is a broader system. thing than just Joanna Hindley. This is about basically Tony Gallagher trying to say stories like this would never have ha will never happen if we have Leveson, which I just don't think is true. If you read Leveson, it's full of praise for the Telegraph. But you must expenses. admit that, it, that there's now a uh, suspicion that that would be the case. <laughs> he think, was able to run a leader on that day saying, now you see I what happens. I think there's happens, a big worry let that Leveson, get involved Leveson gets press. misrepresented by both sides. We've got a very worrying story in the newspaper today about a journalist in Croydon apparently being threatened by police for basically doing a job of good journalism. And I think uh, on both sides, in terms of not interpreting Levson the wrong way, let's not say it's, um, it would stop any story about expense being published. Of course it would. These stories on, should still I be rem published. I remember they shouldn't every, be misrepresented. every Tom, Dick and Harriet was sending letters citing Leveson saying you can't report my wrongdoings. Some people who are now facing very serious trials, I won't name them for, for good reasons of contempt, I won't name them, and it seems here with the Culture Secretary, the message was you investigate my expenses, you mm. expose what I've been doing, and press regulation will come down tougher on you. That's a very serious threat. The wider story in this, looking back at the expenses, is that the independent investigation is really quite damning on Maria Miller, mm. but the MPs in the House water it down, and she has to apologise for a matter of process rather than of the expenses and pay a much smaller amount back. I mean, they're still marking their own homework, aren't they? They are. I, I think it, it would be fair to say that there is a big divide between the press and MPs, including some who are not at all involved in expenses scandals or alleged scandals. They do feel that we've gone over the top and they, there is a, a, a mood that says, enough, we've had enough of this. Therefore, Maria Miller is extremely lucky in her timing, because I think if this had come out earlier, and there are many other cases, like Tony McNulty and Labour, who I think had to resign on comparable uh, situations. Uh, some people will say that the press has gone over the top. Some will say we're simply mm. doing our job and following the expenses story through to the bitter end. I don't know whether a laugh or cry, because one of the big <laughs> legitimate complaints about the old form of press regulation, the Press Complaints Commission, is editors sat in judgment on editors. MPs would make that criticism. What are MPs doing? They're sitting in judgment on one of their own. And bizarrely, I can't remember a single case when they've come in with a heavier penalty after reading this independent standards report from, the, from their own commission. I think they, gonna, always they always suffer. I, I think they're going to get back credibility and expenses. Yeah. They need to get away from this marking their own homework thing. Mm. MPs should have a voice in the, in, the, in the system, of course, but they have to get away from yeah. just marking their own homework. Well, if the Culture Secretary thought this story was going to go away after her apology, mm. she's been sadly wrong. Thank you very much. It's just 31 seconds. The fallout from the Maria Miller expenses episode may take up a lot more airtime. Tonight, The Telegraph has released an audio transcript of the moments they claim Maria Miller's aide told them to leave the expenses story alone. The former editor of the newspaper says his staff were threatened with tougher press regulation if they went ahead. Number 10 says the allegations are utterly false. Well, today, as a Labour MP called on the police to investigate the expenses, the Prime Minister defended his culture secretary and declared the Standards Committee, which judged her, to be independent. Here's Jim Reid. A handsome, double-fronted period house with excellent entertaining space in good condition. So went the estate agent blurb for the Culture Secretary's five-bed property in South London when it was sold in February. The committee has recommended that I apologise... Yesterday, Maria Miller was cleared of making false expenses claims related to that house, but she still had to pay back £6,000 in mortgage interest and apologise for her attitude to an inquiry triggered by a story in the Daily Telegraph. Today, she still had the support of the Prime Minister. What happened yesterday is that uh, Maria Miller was actually cleared of the original charge made against her. Uh, it was found she had made mistakes. She accepted that, repaid the money. She apologised unreservedly to the House of Commons. So I think that we should leave it there. But that attempt to draw a line under the affair hasn't worked, at least so far.
At the centre of all this are now claims by The Telegraph that its reporters were threatened, repeatedly told by government spin doctors that it's the Culture Secretary, Maria Miller, who's in charge of press regulation. This evening, The Telegraph released the audio of a phone call between one of its reporters, Holly Price, and Joe Henley, Maria Miller's special advisor at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. It starts by Henley complaining that The Telegraph has turned up on Maria Miller's doorstep and harassed her elderly father, who had health problems. Um, and I should just flag up as well, while still on it, that when she doorstepped him, she got Maria's father, who's just had a and come out um, and Maria has have, obviously been having quite a lot of editors meetings sorry, sorry um, around uh, Leveson at the moment <laughs> so I'm just going to kind of flag up that connection for you to think about what, right? I'm, I'm not meant to knock on people's doors what, on, knock on the doors of people that just come out of and have yeah, mm -hmm. I would suggest that was probably a good thing. You can't possibly know that until you've knocked on somebody's door. Well, no, Holly, but you could possibly know that had you spoken to people a little bit higher up in your organisation who do know that. Right. Anyway, we'll leave it there, but please forward me the email. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye. It's that reference to the Leveson inquiry into press regulation, which The Telegraph and its former editor claim was a veiled threat to the reporter. Maria Miller's advisor, Joe Hinley, claims the reference to Leveson in the phone call was simply an attempt to warn the reporter that the culture secretary regularly speaks to her direct bosses at the paper and would therefore be likely to raise the issue of potential harassment. But the day after that phone call, Craig Oliver, the head of communications at Downing Street, called then editor Tony Gallagher at The Telegraph when again it's claimed the subject of Leveson was raised as a threat. This evening, Craig Oliver said, It is utterly false to suggest that I threatened Tony Gallagher over Leveson in any way. The conversation I had with him was about the inappropriate doorstepping of an old man. Newsnight understands there is a lot of anger among backbench Tory MPs at the way this has played out. Some believe it's left the PM looking very weak. One MP told us he contacted David Cameron, saying he now has two choices. Either come out strongly and hammer, as he puts it, the telegraph for telling lies, or else he has to tell his own communications chief, Craig Oliver, he must now go. Whatever happens, all this is starting to bring back memories that politicians of all parties will want to forget. David Cameron said after the 2009 expenses scandal that only through transparency and accountability will the public get its power back from the political elite. His critics will use this latest row to show that five years on, that isn't yet the case. I think she's been treated very leniently compared with the way others have been treated. But, I mean, let's and get I think the public, the public have an uh, enormous contempt for politicians who scam their expenses. That's I, what I think. I think you're right. I think there is a problem clearly with expenses. But there's a, we have a, the rule of law in Britain, and if you break the law, there are, there's, a, there's a judicial process, and people who broke the law, colleagues of ours, have been sent to jail, um, and they've done their time. Yeah. There's no um, indication, there's no sign, or no one is suggesting that Maria broke the law. Um, she was accused of something, I think it was John Mann, one of our parliamentary colleagues, on the Labour side, and the investigation actually of, of, on John Mann, what he said, I, I understand that she was exonerated. So, but there was, uh, she apologised fully. People said the ap apology could have been longer. Um, but, um, but I think, I think, as it stands, she should be allowed to continue in her job. But, um, well, I, I worry when I hear people banding around words like fraud in a sort of rather casual way. I mean, there, there obviously is a distinction between fraud and cheating and scams on the one hand and mistakes on the other. Now, I don't know the details of this case, but the people who investigated it, there is a, a parliamentary standards group, people from each of the different parties represented on it, who looked at this case and came to the conclusion on the facts that she was not involved yeah. in a deliberate deception, but that there had been a mistake. And she, Why did she have to apologise then? Well, she apologised for making a serious mistake, and she's repaid, repaid yeah. the money. I mean, the, you know, there was a proper process. I mean, had she been involved in anything dishonest, and had the Standards Committee found that, of course she'd have had to go, 
and she would have had to face probably police action for some of our do colleagues you know would. I, but there was a I very think... clear distinction and say an independent body established that there was no fraud in this case. Her apology was uh, for the way that she handled the Commissioner's yeah. inquiries. It wasn't yes, the Yes, and that's itself. the point, David. I mean, I think what I find depressing about this, I don't know the details, and she obviously was exonerated, but what, what I did read was that the inquiry had found that she was uncooperative. And that's what depresses me about this. You know, she may have been above board, it may have been fine, but, you know, you have to... to have the grace as a public servant who, to treat these inquiries seriously. Sure. Uh, the, the woman there shouted out then just then. Yes, yes. She the, the apology was for obstructing the investigation. That was what she was apologising for. So what does that say about her character? You know, should she really be... Yeah. 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 What, what do you think? Do you think she should have resigned? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, do? I do. Yeah. Right. Um, also, yes. On the left there, on the gangway. She, she I want to get should, people who haven't spoken yet. Yes. She should have been sacked. This is very black and white. At the end of the day, take law, <laughs> take law out of the equation. She's an MP and there is a moral grounds here for to her to be sacked. There's one thing to make a mistake over a couple of months. This was over a prolonged period of time. She claimed on inch, or for interest that she wasn't being charged. I work in the private sector. If I made mistakes on my expenses every month, I would be sacked. <laughs> Quasi, you're, 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 in, you're a colleague of hers in the same yeah, party. I, I, Just briefly answer that point, because I want to go on look, to another question. I think she's a very capable minister. I think there, there is a case for saying, I think she's doing a very good job. I think she's doing... I think she is in a moral position. She's an MP. She's voted in. She should be sat. She has a grounds to live up to. And, the ru and going to say that the rules that she was living with at the time mean that she, she didn't have to live up to a certain code is irrelevant as well. She is in a role, she has a moral code to live up to, and she failed that, and she failed the public. I'm, I'm afraid... Look, I know passions are very strong here, but I'm afraid I disagree with you. I don't think that... Uh, you know, there, was an independent, there was an independent inquiry... There was an independent inquiry... That, was, that exonerated her. Other colleagues of mine have, be, have faced criminal charges and they've been convicted and they've been sent down to court, if, if, uh, uh, sent down to jail, and, and I don't think that right. this is a, a, a resigning... The last you, point from you, sir, in the tie there. Quasi, you can't say that because ultimately what this is about is the three of you telling us yeah. you're whiter than white. And, Simple and as that. I'm a civil right. servant. Yeah. If you're I did that, right. I would be sacked. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, also, Peter, um, well, we must leave this. But you're, you're saying he's right. Uh, well, I'm, and I'm, I'm she should resign. Right. I'm, I'm not saying whether she'd resign or she should have been sacked. That's a matter for others. What's but I'm right saying about? he's right to say that when politicians don't okay. pay the price, when something like this happens, it brings us into even more contempt. It does. But, uh, the, the real cost of democracy.